Today, we're going to talk about populations. So far, we've been focusing most of our energy thinking about insects and arthropods more generally as organisms, how they relate to the environment. Now we're going to think about them as a collection of individuals, a population. And what governs the size of those populations? Remember, one of the basic ideas of ecology is to understand the abundance and distribution of organisms. So why are they common in some places at certain times and not so common at other times? This is one of the fundamental questions in population ecology. Here's an example of the dynamics of populations of, uh, of insects. Take, for example, the, uh, the case-bearing moth here in black. The populations of these organisms in this particular study uh, seem pretty stable over time through the 1970s and 1980s, and suddenly there was a decline. You know, actually not so sudden, and maybe it started around here, there was a decline in their abundance from, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, 1.8 log units, so this is a base 10, to almost two orders of magnitude, uh, you know, less than that. So what is it that caused the decline in the population? In this particular uh, example, there were two parasitic insects that were released in the 1980s as part of a biological control program. And we're gonna talk a lot more about biological control in this particular unit. And uh, as their uh, parasitism of uh, the case-bearing moths increased here, not as much for this species here, there seemed to be a concomitant decline in this, uh, in this herbivorous uh, insect. So one of the patterns that we uh, sometimes try to explain is are the declines of herbivorous insects, for example, determined by their predators and their parasitoids, like in this case here. Here's a classic study of uh, uh, this particular uh, weevil here, uh, Brucid that feeds in the seeds of um, uh, legumes. Here, it's a very important stored grains uh, pest. This was actually a, a laboratory study that, they're, uh, that they were following, where the population size was quite high uh, for a period of time, fluctuating around some kind of average here, high average that was uh, economically damaging. And upon the release of a uh, parasitoid into these chambers, uh, the parasitoid, uh, you know, increased in abundance, which really, which was associated with a very rapid decline and a different equilibrium of the pest after the introduction of this um, of this parasitoid. The applied nature of these particular questions, the suppression of a an insect that was uh, causing harm to something that we care about, uh, trees here or stored grains. Uh, by the release of a predator is one of the key things that, um, that entomologists have worked on in the field of biological control, and it relies on an understanding of the ecology of populations. In fact, one of the applications of basic ecological principles has been in the study of biological control. And in biological control, the idea is that we're trying to reduce the abundance and damage that is done by uh, non-desirable species through the manipulation of, uh, um, of a desirable species, either by intentionally uh, introducing them, increasing their populations, or changing the environment in a way that makes them more, um, more uh, effective. If you, this is a summary here of uh, uh, studies that actually looked at that relationship between the introduction of a predator and the consequences for a prey. And uh, what you see here is the ratio of the population with the natural enemy compared to that without the natural enemy. And for many biological control uh, introductions that become successful, often the populations uh, with the natural enemy, uh, the predators or the parasites, are about half or more smaller uh, than that they are without uh, without those. So this is the ratio of a population with or without uh, a predator. And in the field, some of these studies here show that populations uh, with the presence of predators or parasitoids were as much as 99% lower, for example, here than in the absence of, uh, of those predators. One of the key things that uh, entomologists working on the population ecology in the supplied context 
uh, posited was that there is an equilibrium that populations are normally at and manipulation or changes uh, in the relationships with uh, a consumer or a, a predator. This is often referred to as the equilibrium uh, paradigm. So just like that Brukit example, you know, the populations uh, kind of fluctuate around some kind of uh, uh, average. Uh, when there is the introduction of a consumer, like a predator or parasite, uh, the, negative, the negative effects of, the, of these consumers on the herbivore population cause a decline uh, to, some new, uh, to some new equilibrium. And if that equilibrium is below a threshold that is considered damaging, then uh, this is a success. This is what we, uh, what we want to see. Part of what we're gonna talk about today is uh, the nature of how populations are regulated in the first place, what sets these abundances, and uh, how natural enemies and how predation uh, may be influencing those. One thing that is uh, often um, obvious when you look at the relationship between a consumer, that is an organism that, that feeds on a resource, and its resource is that the consumers can often have a big impact on the abundance of their resources, whether the consumer is a predator feeding on an herbivore on that plant, or whether the consumer is an herbivore feeding on its host plant. Here's an example for uh, here's an example of uh, this uh, particular uh, weevil here, uh, this little apion that feeds and. Uh, the, that lays its eggs and the larvae feed in the seeds of this particular uh, plant that is uh, often um, can become a, a weed in some places. And uh, studies have actually shown that as much as 90% of the seeds of this particular plant uh, could be fed upon by the weevil, uh, limiting the ability of these plants to recruit into the next generation. Interestingly, despite this really high level of herbivory on their, uh, their host plants, this weed seems to be expanding uh, and remaining at very high levels. So here's a question uh, for you to ponder, and that is, does the intensity of predation necessarily set the size of a population? Why wouldn't that be? Why would that not be, be the case? Here's another example looking at uh, bark beetles. Bark beetles are eruptive uh, insects. These brown and red areas here are dead trees, basically, that have been uh, uh, fed upon by, by these bark beetles. And uh, one pattern that was uh, noted by this group of researchers here is that when you, um, when you look at the population uh, abundance of this southern pine beetle, SPB, over time, Population abundance uh, was low over the years here, increased significantly, and then decreased as this outbreak kind of uh, tapered off like that. So again, part of population ecology is trying to understand what causes these fluctuations uh, like this. And bark beetles are actually one of the better understood or better studied, really, uh, systems that, that we have. And one thing that this group of researchers found doing an experiment looking at one of the predators of uh, the bark beetles. Here you can see this uh, uh, clarid beetle feeding on an adult of, the, uh, of uh, the southern pine beetle, is that when you compared uh, trees that were either protected or exposed to the predatory beetle, you found that survivorship was significantly lower when the predatory beetles had access to those trees. So here's an, uh, so survivorship was, you know, less than uh, 20% uh, of the, when, uh, when the clarids had access compared to 30% when uh, there wasn't. And they speculated here, based on this observational study, that uh, this high degree of mortality could be associated with these uh, declines uh, during these. Uh... Similarly, what they found is that the population rate of growth of uh, the bark beetles was uh, highest on trees that were where the predators were excluded compared to where the predators were allowed to have access uh, to them. Again, leading more evidence that perhaps this fluctuation, this up and down of the population is due to the activity, presence and activity of these predators that are decreasing the survivorship and decreasing the population growth rate.
of the uh, of the bark beetles. I'll show you one more example here that just summarizes populations of a whole variety of, uh, of organisms that show that populations often cycle quite a bit for some population. This is the larch bud moth here, uh, voles, these are not insects, obviously voles at some uh, latitudes are highly cyclic uh, like this. On the other hand, at other latitudes, uh, populations are much higher and have much more stable uh, dynamics. The dynamics of populations can be highly variable uh, depending on the species and where uh, the species uh, actually occur. One of the groups that I've uh, spent a lot of time working on are these wonderful little uh, chironomids here. And one of the neat things about them is that they have highly variable populations with low or almost non-existent numbers in some years, like here and here and here, and then these wild eruptive uh, abundances that increase by two to three to four orders of magnitude, and then the population crashes right away. Why is that? Why is it that some species have very stable dynamics and others, on the other hand, have highly fluctuating uh, dynamics? And this is actually what it looks like. That's me in a cloud of these midges during one of these years of these highly eruptive uh, dynamics. And here's, on the other hand, an example of uh, the dynamics of the red scale, um, one of the pests that we talked about uh, at the very beginning of class having to do, um, that attacks uh, oranges. Uh, red scale is attacked uh, by variety introduced parasitoids, including this little um, aphelenid uh, here. And one of the classic cases of stable populations uh, that um, that don't fluctuate and that seem to be that seem to be maintained at a lower equilibrium are in fact these red scales uh, and their natural enemies and uh, and here's an example of what happens when you wipe out the natural enemies with the spray of D with DDT sprays once you've you've killed off the uh, the parasitoids populations of the red scales can explode and are highly are highly variable. So these are the kinds of examples that people would look at and say, why is it that you have extreme stability in some cases and extreme fluctuations in other cases? Is it because there are these two different equilibria that are maintained by, uh, by predators or is there something else going on? Is this, pre is this uh, equilibrium paradigm really uh, what, uh, what we need to be thinking about? So the key questions in uh, population ecology are, again, what factors cause the fl fluctuations in population density or size? Uh, what governs the extent of those population fluctuations, why they get big and small? And why is it that some populations are very high and sometimes they're uh, quite low for different, uh, different species? So what sets the average abundance of those? And, and we'll spend the uh, remainder of this particular lesson here, try to dissect apart uh, some of the factors that might be responsible for that. And of course, I've already alluded to the fact that consumers uh, may be important in, uh, in driving this. Predators, parasites, disease, things like that.